So welcome to our today's lecture, which will be about protein localization as well. Um, I am a, in the meantime, a postdoc here in the Ross lab. I did my PhD on this topic. I started working on it as part of my master thesis, which then later on turned into a PhD thesis. And uh, I had a lot of fun working on that. It brought me pretty much across the whole world. Um, I wrote some, something like 18 papers about it. So this field is really, really hot, and I think that still there is a lot um, to do. So if you will be interested in continuing this kind of part, then talk to Burkhard, oh, or to me, as long as I'm here. <laughs> All right, so protein localization, what is that? Well, first of all, protein localization. I will skim through the slides from last week just for the guys to hear these things again. So maybe you guys talk instead of me. I will ask questions and then you talk. And then it's also good for you that you uh, memorize more things. Okay? But I will help you, so don't worry. Don't be scared. <laughs> okay, protein function. Um, so this is a cell. And cells, living cells, they are compartmentalized. Uh, in a cell we have different compartments and each compartment performs uh, its uh, specific cellular function. Which compartments can you name that we see here? Uh, this one, what happens here? It's uh, where the DNA is stored. Okay, what else? ER. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, ER. ER. I heard. <laughs> I heard ER. Yeah. I don't know how to pronounce it in English. Um, Endoplasmatic reticulum. Okay. Very good. Do you know what happens there? Uh, I know some functions of formula, but I don't know. Um, but that's, that's, that's too advanced for this lecture, anyways. That's where pretty in translation is taking place. What else do we have? Blue guys are mitochondria. Very good. What, what happens there? Energy. Energy. Super good. Generation. Powerhouses, yes. <laughs> and do you remember where these blue guys are coming from in our cells? We spoke about it briefly before. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. At some. DNA, huh? some they have their own DNA, exactly. That was the story with three parents' babies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at some point a eukaryotic cell has swallowed a bacterial cell and then for some reason it did not process it but just kept it and it turned out to be useful. Okay, so we also have membrane. This is also a compartment. We also have extracellular space. It's also a compartment. Things happen there as well. We also have this uh, jelly substance. It's called cytosol. It's also a compartment. So uh, basically anything that you see here is a compartment. Just need to find the right word for it. All right, so here are some examples. Um, right, and each of the compartments, there are different proteins, and each of the proteins performs the, its specific function, right? As you said, Nicholas, in the DNA, we, uh, in the nucleus, we have DNA maintaining proteins. On the ER, we have these kind of proteins. Um, on the cell membranes, we have these proteins. In the mitochondria, we have these proteins, and they all are very different in their functionality, in their shape, in their function. And um, the reason why we are so needed, the bind permutations, is because of the sequence to function gap. Can you guys who were here last time summarize what is this gap about? And why is there such a desperate need for <laughs> prediction, machine learning based prediction methods? Remember, there are biologists who make experiments in order to determine protein function. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time. What else? Costs it costs money. Mm -hmm. What else? It's for error. Absolutely so, but computational methods as well, but yes. What else? If you, if you remember how much it costs to sequence an organism, the amount of what we are sequencing today is like crazy, and the number of sequences they are expanding. Remember, and if we sequence a new bacterium or so, all we do to find its 
genes. We just run a gene predictor over it, and then we have already our predicted genes, and they go into the Unipro database. And that's why this number is so big. But if you compare this number to the manually annotated proteins, then you see that there is a big gap <laughs> that we want to close. So just to give you guys as an example, the first human genome was sequenced 2011, 15 years ago, right? And it cost, do you know how much, do you remember? Sequencing, sequencing a human genome. How many? How much it cost. Oh, how much? Back in the time, how much? 15 years ago, mm -hmm. 15 years ago. 15 million euros. More, we talk dollars. No, yeah. well, <laughs> uh, 500 million dollars, 5 billion dollars, <laughs> 1 billion. 1 billion dollars, 15 years ago. 15 years ago, 1 billion dollars. Nowadays, they say it's something like 1,000 dollars. <laughs> so, so, you see the sequencing cost, it's like, yeah. Uh, different. And so what we need, what is our expectation or the expectation of uh, drug developers and scientists in general is that if we have this many protein sequences like that, we give them into some method, some predictor, machine learning based for example, and the output should be protein function. Something that we would see in a, in a, in a, in a real experiment at the microscope, I don't know. And, uh, yeah, and this should be done at, at, at a high accuracy. So this should be done reliably. So this is the whole motivation behind the field of bioinformatics of what we do here in the lab. Okay, so protein function can be described in different ways. Gene ontology provides one of the ways to describe protein function. We spoke about it last time. Gene ontology, this is a vocabulary. Um, it has three main components, cellular component, molecular function, biological process. So protein function can be described by, by, by each one of them. Um, as a recap, let's let's try to think of examples for each one of them. Okay, so cellular component can be, for example, nucleus. Yeah? Biological process, what can it be? What biological processes do you know? I remember I didn't want to. <laughs> 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 that was a great one. <laughs> When I come to the club, I feel right. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember the molecular function we talked about. Which, which one was it? Enzyme. Totally. Enzyme. Well, what, what else can it be? Like, what, what, what other molecular function can it be? Actually, let me, let me work on that. During the everyday life, I mean, just not your, something that has nothing to do with life. Anything that you, that you know that enzymes are used for? Um. Moving stones. Hmm? That's laundry. <laughs> you say you tell me, mate, you happen to do your laundry or something like that. There are enzymes at work. Uh, tons of stuff that has to do with everyday work. Uh, cleaning up the water. It's also not done mathematically. Oh yeah, or splitting DNA. Maybe you have followed the news recently, like maybe two, three months ago, this CRISPR enzyme that can cut your DNA very precisely and so you can cut out bad genes and you can enter, put in good genes. That's also enzymatic activity. Have you heard about it? No? Yeah, but this is, this is, this is what is a new excitement in, in the field of biology. This is like this precise engineering of DNA. That's what happens. Uh, crazy, just read about it. It's, it's, it's really mind-blowing. As far as it can, it can bring us, it's like really amazing. Anyways, biological process. <laughs> process is something that is in a verb. So if you think of a protein that can do this uh, function, just add the Z, whatever it can be, and then it will be a process. So, for example... Something that does something with ATP. <laughs> it's not a process. <laughs> it's, oh. uh, okay, generates uh, energy. Yeah. Yeah, what else? I don't know. 
since when I read the DNA or something. Hmm? There should be a process to read the DNA. Yeah, that uh, tran transcribes so the, DNA. the DNA. Yeah. Exactly. So just think of verb as yes, and yeah, this will be the exactly uh, word for biological process, or catalyzes, or um, uh, binds um, these things. Yeah? Everyone? Clear? Yes, no? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you have more examples. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but this is, by the way, that we ask you to define. Um, oh, yeah, by the way, let's talk about cellular components. So I said that nucleus is one, is, would, could be one of the examples for cellular component ontology, but this is a tree, right? This, this looks like this. So it goes down, there will be more child nodes, and they would be more specific than the parent node. So let's think of an example of a parent and a child node for cellular component. Can you think of something? Be sure this will be asked. Uh, I should not say that? Not sure. I'm not so sure. We ask this very often. That is true. The probability is high, higher than this will be asked. <laughs> it's not 100%. Maybe, maybe intra, no, yeah. intracellular? Totally, and? And then maybe mitochondria. Super cool. Yeah. Or nuclear and nuclear membrane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or in, intra? Intranuclear, in, exactly. Intra is inside, right? Yes. Inter is between. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Excellent. And so <laughs> we saw the cell, we saw on, on our schematic representation that there were a few compartments, but as a matter of fact, the gelondology describes described three years ago something like this many terms. So so you can go you can be very, very, very precise in the terminology about subcellular localization. This is pretty amazing, this number. Anyways. We have our eukaryotic cells and we have bacterial cells. Bacterial cells, they are older uh, than eukaryotic cells and they are much, much simpler. Um, they, don't have, they don't have organelles like eukaryotic cells do, but they also have compartments. Again, we have the simplest one. This is the extracellular space. We have membrane. Sometimes bacterial cells have one, sometimes they have two membranes. There is the cytoplasm again, and there we find our proteins and DNA. So this is the structure of a prokaryotic cell um, and the motivation for predicting localization is that um, yeah, if proteins are functioning in the same compartment, like in the nucleus, then we can think, we can assume that they probably have a very similar function. Right. So localization defines function. If we know that the protein is localized in the nucleus, then we can be sure that it's not. Its function is not something like energy generation or something. Make sense? And vice versa. So localization, this is an aspect of function. Okay, um, so what is the application of all of that? Well, one of them that is in drug development, we spoke about it last time, that something like um, uh, eighty percent of all drugs that target either membrane, cytoplasm, or extracellular. Do you remember what, why, why it was the reason? So imagine of all drugs, of the many drugs that that are out there that target only this kind of proteins. <laughs> why is that? Mm -hmm. Because we need to get the drug into the cell. Yeah, and so um, you need something that brings the drug into the cell. And this would be like all of them. Very good. So you were not here last time. How do you know all of that? I don't know. I have a girlfriend who studies pharmacy. Oh, okay. <laughs> she studies pharmacy. <laughs> so, <laughs> that helps. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so the, the, the designing a drug that would go into the nucleus is much, much harder than to design a drug that would bind to something that sits on the membrane or even in the extracellular space, right? So this is just, just uh, it's more financially, it just makes more sense to develop this kind of drugs. And we spoke about it last time as well. To develop a drug, it takes something like 13 years on average. Costs about billion dollars. 
right? More. More than that. So, and it just makes more sense to, to develop something that is more likely to work, going to bind, than to develop something that, that is so complicated, has to find its way through the membrane, the intracellular space, into the nucleus, and so on. I found it pretty fascinating when I read about it. Anyways. There are many, 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 many different drugs, and this is an overview of what these drugs target, and uh, proteins in what compartments, and what they are for. And we see that these are, yeah, all kinds of things, including cancer, much cancer, and other diseases. And this is another table, pretty interesting one, that shows us that if there is a protein with a localization signal, this NLS means nuclear localization signal, this is a signal that brings a protein into the nucleus of the cell, so if there is a mutation, then, well, uh, yeah, different diseases can happen. Uh, yeah, and we see that the range is also white. <laughs> right, and here we spoke about yeah, a mass localization of one single protein and what was happening. Can you tell what this is? Or you maybe? No? Can you guys tell? Solution? Uh huh, so what's happening? It's not separated. It stays bonded to the right. Yeah, so for you guys, this is, this is how it happens normally, this is healthy state. So we have a cell, and then cell starts dividing, it builds the structures on both poles of the cell. See, they are nicely symmetric and stuff, and then they pull two cells apart, and then they become separated. This is how it goes normally. If there is a mislocalization of one single protein, this one, then cells, they start dividing, but they're not able to completely separate uh, from each other. And these structures, they're not symmetric anymore, they happen all over the place and instead of dividing, the cell starts, like the whole structure starts growing and the result of it, do you remember, what, 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 what is this? It's, it's tumor. Hmm? Yeah. Normally, actually this happens uh, quite often, um, I believe uh, a day we have like a thousand mutations in our DNA, but think is, is that if we're healthy and everything is good, then there are processes that protect us. They, this, this kind of things, they're being recognized and eliminated automatically. Yeah, so normally this is not a problem. So, don't get scared. <laughs> um, all right, so why is this field of subcellular localization so interesting? Why do people work on this already for something like 20 years? Well, because knowledge of localization provides information about its function. As we said before, if it's in one compartment, then we can exclude other functions. Uh, it helps to identify um, uh, targets during the drug, develop drug discovery process. If we know that we want to target a protein that sits um, uh, sits, say, in the nucleus, then we know how to define, sort of know, how to, how to develop our drug so that it makes its way through the whole cell and gets into the nucleus. Um, we just said that if aberrant local, uh, location, if something happens and protein gets mislocalized, then it can lead to diseases, so we want to be able to identify that based on the sequence as well. And finally, um, knowledge of localization helps us to validate protein-protein interactions. Why? Because imagine, with, do you know what protein-protein interactions are? How? <laughs> How do they interact? <laughs> so what happens? Just, just in very, very simple words. <clears throat> hmm? Maybe one carries the other one. Yeah, so what happens is that they bind. This is interaction, and then they can do whatever, different things. So if two proteins are in the same compartment, then the, lock, then the probability that they're going to be interacting is way higher than if they would be like in completely different compartments, right? And so, um, how many proteins do we have? Where? In our bodies. I mean, per cell. Per, no, sorry, per, per cell we have like thousands, so like hundreds of thousands. Um, how many proteins are encoded in our genome? 
How long is the genome? Hmm? How long is the genome? How long is the genome? <laughs> Guys, how long is the genome? We're talking now about base pairs. Yeah. Yeah, how long is it? <coughs> okay, let's guess. <laughs> um, yes. Sometimes longer than one dollar per base. 16 years ago. So it was uh, it's 3 billion? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Uh, no. 3 billion. This is like a number that you need to know. So you need a start and stop column. Mm -hmm. So that's 6. So you have to divide that at least by 6. And then you need some base pairs to actually have a protein. So approximation. Uh, I can't calculate my head. That's impossible. <laughs> It's the number. Yeah. Five, five, it's the number. Let's say one hundred million. One hundred million proteins. Yeah, or less. One hundred. Yes, or less is right. <laughs> so, so, so let's let's get back to the ba uh, very very basics. Okay. We have. Hold on. Give me an exponent. To the wait, 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 wait. Well, one, one second. Okay. One important thing to thing to tell: we have our DNA. We have prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryotes are those one-cell organisms, bacteria, and archaea. You know what to talk about, right? And we have eukaryotes. Everyone is with me? Yeah. Okay. In bacteria, what we have? We have start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. So you can somewhat approximate the number of proteins in in prokaryotes. Okay. Yeah. In eukaryotes, we have start, stop. Then we have region where there is nothing, non-coding DNA, and then somewhere here will be new gene. Start, stop, start, stop, maybe. And then there is again nothing. As a matter of fact, only four percent of our DNA encodes proteins. Four percent, ninety-six. That's we don't know what the function is. Change something, something happens, right? Or uh, something happens, why it happens, we don't know. Not always. So in the non-coding, what we have, for example, when we make a child parent tests, that we make them on this non-coding things. They are non-coding, but the mutations are there. Um, or um, analysis, uh, criminal blood tests and stuff. We also make on the non-coding DNA. Because the probability of mutations is higher because something that encodes, encodes protein, it wants to stay. Um, something that is not function encoding, ah, it can, different things can happen. The organism doesn't care so much. Make sense? Okay. So, <laughs> uh, the number is way, way lower than 100 million. 100,000. 100,000. That's what we thought when we sequenced. Actually, 2011, they ran the program, the gene identifying program, and the program told 100,000. And everyone was like, whoa, we're so complex. Um, something like a plant has, I don't know, 40, 40 to 50,000. And we were like, yes, you're more complex than plants. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out that the number is less. 30. Less. Some plants have more. Huh? Some plants have more than 100,000. Even that. Even worm has something, as many proteins as we do. And 3,000. 3,000? Yeah. Well, a yeast, a baker's yeast, Hefe, has 6,000. We are more complex than that. Seven. Okay, it's 20,000. <laughs> <laughs> it's between 20 and 25,000. Okay? Yes. So, there is not a single number. Um, like the exact number of proteins that does not exist because it, this number changes every single month with a new update of SwissProt. The number changes. Um, people either identify or dismiss uh, previously known proteins, but it's in the range between 20 and 25. This number you have to know. <laughs> Put it down, you have to know. <laughs> um, right, why I asked about it, how many protein-protein interactions can be there actually theoretically if we're talking about 20,000 proteins? Oh, we spoke about it last time. I remember it's uh, possible number of directions. 
interactions. <laughs> yeah, but we, were, we, were, we were different opinions. Uh, right. I, I was thinking that it's n over 2. I actually think so. Two pairs out of a set of n elements. Uh -huh. Yes, and I said that it's it's binomial. N minus one in brackets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Divided by two. Uh, What's the question? How many yeah. interactions are there theoretically? Can be there theoretically. N by the n minus one power. Okay. N n over two. No, no, uh, uh, not n square. I mean, roughly n square over n by the n minus one over over two. Yeah. This is roughly n squared power. N squared power, this. Two hundred thousand. Uh, two hundred thousand. No, it's no. no, it's a big, no, no big, big, much bigger than that. Ten k times twenty k. Four, four, eight. Many good. So Yeah. So, so. Many. Yeah. But what two hundred? Four hundred then. Four hundred. Ah, that would be two, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So imagine if you want to study all possible pretty yeah, well, well, again, so A, B, and B, A is the same. Right. Right. This is, this is why it's... That's why it's... That's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the diagonal so it's a, of, that's no, why it's N minus 1. When I say N over 2, I don't mean, I don't mean N divided by 2, I mean... N yes, by binomial. Binomial code. Binomial code. No, 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 that's a much bigger number. No, 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 no it is the... Of pairs in the set of N elements. Yeah. No, but like the number of edges in a graph, no, no, and you just imagine it to be a matrix. It's a very simple matrix. <laughs> everybody can work with everybody. There's no matter here. I can think no, of a it graph with n vertices, and the number of edges is the number of interactions. You can think of all kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> you can think of all kinds of things, but if you want to talk, so we would you think about it the way they can group. But I'm talking about how they can form pairs. So the pairs, way they yes. can. Yeah. So that's a matrix. Anyways, yeah, many. Over 20,000, over 20,000, that's the <laughs> matrix, and then there's off the, the, the one diagonal is the matrix, so you move, remove a diagonal, and then the diagonal itself and is trivial. Then they have to twice, hmm? so they have to take the half. Then they have to exactly, and, and then I said n minus 1 because the diagonal doesn't count. Ah, so okay. by the n minus ah, okay. 1, and I go away with the graph. <laughs> with the Whatever, fully so connected <laughs> graph. <laughs> and then I get to the 200 million. <laughs> Which is your favorite bread, uh, uh, width first search or uh, uh, depth first search? Bread or <laughs> <laughs> depth first search? Which is your favorite algorithm? Oh, I don't really have that. Oh, you don't have one. Okay. Other people who have? Hmm? Of course. Why? Because one you for one you use recursion, the other is just iteration. So yeah, but why would you prefer one? Like actually think about it then. Prefer oh, we can talk about it offline. There are reasons. Okay, this sounds good. Interesting. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Let's take can we get Eva to the localization? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anyways, there are very many um, potential protein-protein uh, interactions, and if you exclude those proteins that are residing in different compartments, yeah, then you can reduce the number of pairs like significantly. Make sense? Yeah. Good. So. I hope that you're convinced that localization is a very, very important uh, and useful thing to know. And so, how do we predict localization? Um, okay, so this is a visualization of a high throughput experiment where we color uh, the compartments um, by proteins residing in this compartment. So, these are the nu uh, nuclei. Um, this is um, Orange is the intracellular mitochondrial network, green are microtubules. Um, so there is this technique to identify localization experimentally um, fast. That's why it's called high throughput. But yet there are still problems. Um, I'm going to go very, very quick through the slide because for, the, for this guys, it's a, uh, we spoke already before and for you that's just, yeah. Um, to get a brief idea. So these experiments, they cost money, they're not super accurate, and they're not complete. By accurate, that means that, well, there are still uh, misses. Uh, complete means that 
research is biased towards what is interesting to the people. They would never pay money for something that's not interesting, and that's why not everything is covered. And even for an organism, which is the Baker's East, where we said there are uh, over 6,000 proteins, this Baker's East is probably the most studied eukaryotic organism. Everyone just makes experiments on yeast, and still something like half of its proteome has any localization information. And this is like the most recent information from December this year. So you see that even for this kind of organism, it's really, really hard to determine localization for absolutely all proteins. Um, okay, localization is, so obviously the, there is a need to know the localization. And then the nice part about this problem is that it's, very, it's a very nice prediction problem. And why is it so nice? Well, because um, localization is an easily identifiable functional feature. So if it's in the nucleus, it's clear it is the nucleus, nothing else. Um, the protein trafficking is well understood. This is how proteins travel in the cell. So proteins, they are being synthesized, they're being produced, most of them in the jelly structure called cytosol. And then they travel to different compartments, to the nucleus, to other organelles, or to the cell surface. And the mechanism, how it goes, how this traveling happens, is well understood. It's, it's really a process, how it works, and it is understood. And you can approximate it schematically, it's going to look like that. Okay, localization data is available in public databases, such as Uniprot. And another very nice feature about proteins that makes our lives so much easier is that uh, most proteins, they are active in only one compartment. So most proteins, if they're active in nucleus, then they're going to be active in nucleus, really on the um, minority is going to travel be between different compartments. Okay, so this is how the trafficking looks. Um, as I said, most are produced in the cytosol, and then they go to the nucleus or back. They can travel, or they go to other compartments, like that. Or if their destination is cell surface, then they would go like this, through ER, Golgi, always, then to vesicles and surface. And from the surface, they're going to go back to other compartments. So this is an approximation, and this is how it really is. Now, how do proteins travel? Um, proteins, they have this. So everything, we believe that all function of proteins is encoded in the DNA, because the cells, they also get this information somehow from proteins. I don't ask experts, workers, where, where does it go? It's in the DNA, right? So. Um, localization signals, they are in, encoded in the protein sequence itself. They can be on one of the ends. So if this is the protein, then the signal where it's localized is going to be either this end or this end, or they can be also distributed across the whole sequence. So the signal is being recognized by another protein. So it finds the signal, uh -huh, binds, and then brings it somewhere. Or another protein can recognize the signal only then when the protein takes its three-dimensional uh, structure and then the signal comes together on the surface, it's called signal patch, and then it's being recognized and then the protein is being brought to somewhere else. Okay? Easy, right? Um, the problem with the signals is that they are, if we know them, then you can predict localization very, very nicely. The problem with them is, with them is that we, we have to know them. We have to make experiments in order to identify what the signals are. And, uh, well, we only have what we know, and it's very likely that the majority of those signals we still don't know, because people just haven't done the experiments yet. And for this kind of guys, the situation is even worse. How, how does it work? How do we identify the signals? Well, we have our, <laughs> we have our um, sequence, we do a mutation. We mutate one amino acid. We see that this protein does not localize to the nucleus anymore. We go like, mm-hmm. So this amino acid is part of the signal. If we mutate somewhere here, we see that the protein does go to the nucleus. So we can assume that this is not part of the signal. That's how this identification goes. 
And you imagine that, okay, we know that the signals is, uh, well, on average, maybe 25 amino acids long, so we mutate the first or the last 25 amino acids. Okay, that works, but if we would have to mutate every single amino acid in the whole sequence, you can imagine how much more tiresome <laughs> the whole process is, and so that's why it's so much more difficult to identify them. So that's the story with the sorting signals. Now, um, this professor, his name is Gunther Blobel from Rockefeller University in New York, Burkert knows him. Um, he got a Nobel Prize for saying that um, localization signals, they are actually zip codes of our cells. So the signal tells the cell exactly, so this is the signal, and it tells the cell exactly that it goes into the cell, actually more concrete into the intracellular space, and more specific to nucleus. So they're really, really very specific, like zip codes. Um, so that was a Nobel Prize in 1999. Just recently, three years ago, there was another Nobel Prize given. Uh, for another localization finding, and that's about that um, uh, about how how uh, how proteins actually um, travel in the cell using the vesicular transport. So so imagine that for for one and same biological problem, <laughs> there have been two Nobel prizes given just within the last uh, decade and a half, two decades. So this field is very, very, really important for scientific research, for new scientific discoveries. And many groups for 20 years have been developing localization prediction methods and that's what they were based upon. So these are just different techniques on how to work with protein sequences. They can be applicable also to other problems as well, but localization, again, this is just such an example and it's also very easy to understand. So what they are, okay, one of them that's based on sorting signals. As I said, we just have a database of sorting signals. We check if the signal is present in the, in the sequence. If it's present, we go, okay, we found localization. Fine. What is the problem with this approach? What can you think can go wrong? Okay, so the, <laughs> the problem <laughs> okay, can be that, first of all, we don't know all of the sorting signals. Then it can be a false match, because as I said, it says it's a short region, so it can match, but actually without being a, a signal. Yeah. So even though it's accurate, still there are problems. Now homology-based, um, this is important concept to understand because I will talk about it again. It's if we want to know localization of one sequence, but we know that the homologs are, I don't know, localized in the nucleus, and we, we can assume that our sequence of interest is also in the nucleus. Okay, text-based analysis, that's when we read, for example, um, abstracts of, uh, Articles in databases, and then we with with uh, algorithms, and then we extract information from there. The problem with this approach is that we can only annotate those proteins with localization for which there have been experiments made. If there are no experiments about certain protein, then there is no information. Okay. Um, de novo. De novo means from the first principles. This is we do not use any any external information for our predictions, only the information that is encoded in the sequence. And that's why it's called de novo, from first principles, really like nothing else. And this approach is more, most uh, universal because you can really apply to any protein sequence because you don't require anything else. And finally, there are hybrid approaches that combine any, any of this previous form. All right. When we work with uh, sequences, we have, when we develop any machine learning algorithm, the first, first task what you have to take care of is to look at your data. You have to understand what your data is, um, what are the problems with your data set, how big it is, whether it's clean or not, and if it's uh, dirty, then where does this dirtiness coming from? You, as a machine learning developer, this is, this is one of the main things, maybe, to, to get to know your data set. So, in biology, we know that our data sets are dirty, <laughs> always. Why that? Well, because there are mistakes that can be made at biological levels. Um, 
uh, experimental and curational levels. It can be that someone does not perform experiment clean enough and introduces mistakes in the experiments. It can be that the person performs a perfect experiment but makes a wrong observation, just a wrong interpretation. It can be that the person does absolutely perfect, experiment perfect, observation perfect, but then someone who reads the paper then of this person makes a mistake by putting the right information to the database. So mistakes can happen at any possible level. This is something just to keep in mind with biological data. Okay, other problems, this, this applies again not only to biological uh, problems but really to anything. The performance must be established properly. Um, that there is no similarity between training and test sets, that your, your data sets are unique, that they're not redundant, that you provide results that are very easy, easy to understand by the users of your method. If you provide a text file with this kind of output, um, no one is going to use it just because it's not <laughs> readable, it's not easy understandable. And finally, you have to benchmark your method with other methods in order to say that, yes, actually my method is worth using it because in comparison to the others or to random, I perform well. So this is benchmarking. Hmm? So concepts, very important on this slide. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about my method that I developed during my uh, master thesis, it was called log tree 2. The uh, motivation behind this method is that we take this information that we know about how proteins travel and implement it in our machine learning uh, approach and it was uh, one structure, one approach for absolutely all protein sequences for eukaryotic, bacterial and archaeal. So it's a super universal, super applicable to anything approach. And maybe that's why that was one of, of the most successful methods in this localization uh, problem. All right, so as I said, this is one framework um, for absolutely all proteins. I will show that it's uh, robust even if there are errors, some mistakes in the sequences. It predicts only three classes for archaea, six for bacteria and eight for eukaryota. If you remember my genotology tree, I said that there are 3,000 different localizations, but now I have like this very, very small numbers. Um, These numbers, they're actually still impressive. Um, because, ad well, other methods, they predict maybe twice as many classes and the reason why this number is so low just because that because there is not enough information in the databases um, that we have so even though there are so many different localization classes again people are interested only on certain proteins residing in certain locations and the data is just not big enough to develop a predictor for more classes than this crazy huh okay um, yeah, I will talk about a decision, decision tree that resembles bio, biological protein uh, sorting process. It provides reliability scores that tells a user whether the prediction is trustable or not. And finally, I will show that it has a very high performance. Okay, now, this is the recipe. This is what you do when you apply machine learning, first of all. First and foremost of all, you look at your data set. You try to understand it. Um, a rule of thumb, if you have something like less than 50 instances, don't, don't even touch it. <laughs> if you have something like less than 50 instances, 50 points, don't even touch it. Not worth it. Um, that's one of the principles applicable anywhere. Data sets, again, sometimes they're pretty easy to get. Um, in this lab, we were predicting, for example, something like who is going to die in Game of Thrones. Even for that, <laughs> using machine learning, even for that, there are data sets available. Really, for most problems that you want to apply machine learning for, the data sets are, are actually there. They're open source. But there are, they are always, always, always dirty. You have to understand what you're dealing with and how to clean it. Again, outliers, missing data, size, redundancy. These are the kind of issues that you have to take care of. Okay, then you develop your uh, prediction method, you train it, and this is probably the, 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 the longest, uh, the most, uh, the part that takes most of your time. Because what happens here is that here you have to define what machine learning method you're going to use, what it's going to be its parameters, and so on. 
once you have developed your training, uh, once you have trained your model, you have to test it to see that actually the performance on the, on the testing set is good, it makes sense. And then once this is done, you need to compare your tool to other tools. Now, for me, it's very important to ask this question. Um, you are the first one who develops a machine learning tool for a particular problem. There, are no comp there is no competition yet. So you cannot compare yourself to anyone else. How can you still claim that you are, that your performance is excellent? Say your performance is 30% and you want 30%. So and you want to publish a paper. How, how can you justify to the community that 30% is a good performance? Mm -hmm. Compare it to random. Oh my god. You're good, yes. No, it was just the first step, and then you can think of more sophisticated but still easy baselines. Yes, like what? Uh, for example, if, if you have a regression problem, you can just say take the mean of the, the number you, you're trying to predict. And then? As a baseline. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, as a mean, what does it mean? I mean, it's, it's hard to, to tell. To say in general, so so it really depends on the problem. What kind of baseline you can, okay, well. can use? Okay. If, if you have a prediction, you can just take the, the prior. Ah, you uh, mean you? Glasses. Ah, I see. So not random, but you. St the simplest say. approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so really now, you why is that not random? Yeah, random. If you have five less random, is twenty percent. Depends on your conclusion of random. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but, okay, but that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah, so, well, so there would be a random bias. So you 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 take the data and you just remove labels or something with the same number, then you would get random, right? But it would be the the sample set. But whatever, this is another way of saying random. But I agree with you. You can just apply a very simple algorithm. I don't know. Can it be maybe it's naive base or something, and then. You compare yourself to something that is simpler, simpler than you are. Yeah, totally. Okay, so first data set preparation. For this problem, there is a database called SwissProt. This is the database we're using. Very, very important to know for the exam. Be sure this will be asked 100%. Um, SwissProt, okay, so we take our protein sequences from there, we take the subcellular localization from there, and we take whether it's eukaryotic or not from there. All right, so the data set is very, very redundant. As I said, researchers, they are uh, focused on specific proteins for specific localizations, and so you can imagine that there will be like really many for membrane, pro well, not so many for membrane, but maybe for cytosolic, like for extracellular, many, as we saw, right, in the drug development research, but for other classes, less. So if you, if you develop a predictor on the data set that has so many classes of instances for class A and so many instances for class B, then <laughs> be sure that the predictor is going to only predict A, right? So we have to somehow normalize the sizes, the redundancy in the data sets. And uh, what happens here is that um, in biology is that if we have one sequence, then we can, and there are many, many similar sequences, homologs, then we can just transfer the notation. It's, it's very simple to verify. And so in biology, we have very many similar sequences with the same annotation, and so we want to get rid of these similar sequences. One approach how to do that uh, is to use uh, the HSSP threshold. Have you talked already about it with record? So, okay, <laughs> briefly describe what it is. <laughs> Just briefly, like very, very simple. What is it for? I mean, what's for it's clear, but how does it work? Hmm? I mean, it's, it's basically in the graph what it, what it does. Okay. The graph is just a visualization. Yeah, but okay. it separates uh, two sets. Mm -hmm. And it's a uh, level of confidence. Okay. And so what do we have in the graph? Uh, yeah, we have. Well, it's, it's there. It's a structural graph. And then um, uh, um, the axis. Um, the 
it's, it's rather, uh, should I just read it? Uh, well, no, explain it with your own words. <laughs> in my own words. Yeah. It's just the separation where it's structural. Um, no, the axis. Uh, axis. Yeah, axis, I don't know. Um, identical residue dues per length, maybe. It's so depending on the length. It's just so what what do we what do, where do we get these numbers from like this this number where do we get it from? Um, we get that from many a blast. Mm hmm. And then. Mm hmm. Yeah. Side blast or something. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. And uh, uh. side blast search yes. And then what do they exactly mean this number this terms? Um. So for a certain point on the on the on the, um, on the graph, we, we um, know the length of the protein, mm -hmm. and uh, we know um, when we when we match the protein with another sequence, we know the uh, number of identical residues. Good. <laughs> what the percentage of, of this protein is? Okay. Uh, what, uh, that is identical. Mm -hmm. Everyone got it. Everyone can explain it. Is, is there a more formal way to? <laughs> yeah, the only, the only, the only but that I heard in your explanation is that it's not length of a protein, it's length of alignment. Oh. So you align to proteins, add to protein sequences. You look what is the length of the alignment and how many identical residues they share. Very so, sense. yeah. So the more they share, um, yeah, the more structurally and functionally similar they will be. Okay, so by applying homology reduction, we kept on the proteins that were below the HSS curve. Like there is, there was no homology whatsoever. So that's the the whole principle behind machine learning is that you have a data set that is as diverse as possible, and then you train an intelligent system that finds patterns in this data set, some kind of patterns that we as humans cannot detect, but the algorithm can because it's clever. It identifies these patterns, remembers them, and then applies the same patterns on new data set. Then, that if you come with new data, it will identify these patterns in the new data set. So this is the whole idea behind machine learning. That's generalization. Hmm? And that's why the data set is like so diverse. Yeah? Okay, so, and this is just a visualization. In the beginning we had this much data, after dense reduction we got this much data. <laughs> so it just shows how super redundant our databases are. <laughs> so that if you would develop a machine learning method, well, first of all, your dataset would be like too big. It will take forever to develop it. And it would be super redundant. So actually, it, would, it will take forever, but the outcome will be, yeah. Okay. Uh, stratified key fold cross validation. This is, one of the most central concepts uh, concept when you develop a machine learning method here. Um, so if you ha take your set and then you develop a machine learning method on it, right? You optimize parameters of it and it will perfectly identify, it will perfectly work on your data set. You would go like, yes, 100% performance. I found my perfect parameters, combinations. Now, when you would apply this algorithm to some new data, most probably you're going to fail. Most probably your performance would be like, I don't know, super, super low. And by the way, in general, 100% accuracy, 100% performance, is that justifiable? Because I'm sorry. <laughs> I think battery died. Now it's back. 100% accuracy. Um, I read the paper. You are my jury. I write down, I solved the localization problem. My accuracy is 100%. What would you tell me? <laughs> would, you, would you say like, yes? You overtrained your device. How would you know? Because it seems very unlikely that you... you Why is it unlikely? I remember uh, uh, you can't be better than the error in the data set. And that is because awesome. assume that there is an error in the mm -hmm. biological data set. Or okay. in every data set. Absolutely every data set. Yeah. yeah. 
100% is never possible. If you see someone saying, I sold it, I'm at 100%, you can laugh at this person. It's not possible. So there is some kind of mistake in the, in the development of the training set. Yeah. But it's, it's amazing that so many people, they just forget about the certain steps of developing a method. They forget. Okay, so cross validation they don't forget, but they forget to test on a different data set, for example. They forget to compare themselves to the others. And well, if we see that, then we say, okay, so this is missing. We have to be sure, we have to be convinced to 100% that what you're doing is really accurate and you're doing it right. So this, this procedure, this whole pipeline, this recipe, that's how it's normally beautifully done for any, any problem, machine learning problem. All right, um, so in order to not do that, in order to have enough trading data and enough test data, we apply cross-validation. So what happens here, we have our data set, then we split it into five sets, one, one two, three, four, five, and then we train on four, and we test on the fifth. Then we rotate, we train on the other four, we test on the fifth, then run it again. Then we do, the, we do this five times, and then we train on absolutely all data points. Yeah, half an hour. Half an hour. 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy about that. I have a lot of information to tell. <laughs> and, and so we test on all data sets. Uh, it can be five, it can be three, it can be ten. Five, that's like standard. But what cross-validation is, this is very, very, very important to understand. This will be asked. This is something that is very, very central. Okay, and then on the whole, so we, we have a performance on each of the test sets, and then we average over them, and this will be the performance on our uh, entire test set. So you see this is like a trick in order to train on all and test on all using cross-validation. I'm just curious, is there an equivalent? method to do kind of stratified cross-validation in regression problems? Um, I, okay, so stratified, we have not talked about what stratified means. Oh, sorry. Yeah. What is stratified? That's okay, explain to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, make sure or try to be sure that in every split, uh, split of your cross-validation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. class probability exactly. is yeah. nearly equally distributed. As in the original set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in general, when you develop machine learning method, then you want to have it this way. Yes. Uh, on, in regression problems, okay, so regression problems are, you can have, so for example, linear regression, you know, um, Hold on, there are regression problems that are also classification problems where you predict either one class or the other class. When your class labor labels are nominal, it's going to be a classification problem. So there it's the same. If you talk about regression where you predict values, yeah. um, I think the procedure is the same. Yeah, my question to you is why should it be different? Hmm? Why should it be different? Any parameter for these, so this is a sort of a very generic thing, right? I Any, anything you can do, statistics, parameter, then whatever you call that, typically statisticians don't call it machine learning, but it's essentially the same thing. Yeah, I'm just thinking about if you have uh, five labels, it's clear that you can make sure that the mm -hmm. distribution of the yeah. five labels is the same as in the it's original not paper, sure. we have but the regression is it's a continuous value. Maybe you can so you try to make sure that it has the you same do you do a regression, you you do a regression of the gray. So on the, on the light gray, right? And, and, and then there's a dark gray. And the, the question is, can you always choose data sets where, where you keep the same distributions? That may, not, may, may sometimes be tricky. That, that, that's basically this, right. You yeah, have this to make sure tricky for any kind of right? yeah. that, that may be tricky for anything, right? So the, what you see on the whiteboard is true for every, every optimization problem. The way is generalized there. How you then get drill it down? But the question you are asking is again the same for SVM machine uh, with neural networks and, and linear yeah, regression. Of course, that was not my question. No, no. Oh, then I misunderstood. Mm -hmm. But we can yeah. move on. So yeah, it, we have only forty-five minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Another principle of machine learning, this slide may look confusing, but it's actually very simple. The more training data you have, the better your machine learning is going to work. You, it's always a balance. You should not have too many because it will take forever, but it should, your data set should also not be too small because it won't be way accurate. So you want to find the optimum size, but it should not be too small. In my case, in our case, the data set was too small. You remember after the introduction, I had learning data. So what I did, um, is that I increased my training set, so there was no similarity between training and, te and test, but there were very, very ma many homologous proteins in SwissProt. So what, it, what we did, for every protein in the training set, we just got a homolog from SwissProt and we just added them to, 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 to our training set, but still there was no homology between training and test. Using that, um, I, we increased our training set and the performance actually we saw that it went up a little bit. That's like one of the clever tricks of how to do that. All right, um, performance estimates. It's very important to accurately estimate the performance of your method. Key um, uh, measures are accuracy, which tells you how many of your proteins are correctly predicted so. Yeah, it's pretty simple. Accuracy is also called precision or specificity sometimes. And coverage. And coverage tells how many of your predicted proteins are actually observed to be in the correct localization. This value measurement is called also recall or sensitivity and then you can combine accuracy and coverage, you can put them into one measure like MCC or F1 measure and so on. But that you estimate accuracy and coverage correctly, this is like super important. Um, right, um, now um, when, you have, when you have an estimate, say, let's say at our 30%, Right? You have an estimate on your cross-validation set, it's 30%, uh, but how, how can you be sure that if you apply this method on some other data set and a new one, that the performance will be 30%? Most probably it will not. It's going to change because the data set is going to change. Right? So you want to give some, some uh, interval where your performance is going to hold. So every, anything within this interval it will be true, anything outside this interval will show that your method is not stable. And this interval is given by standard errors. Um, and the method of how to estimate the standard errors is called bootstrapping. The term bootstrapping comes from the book of <laughs> adventures <laughs> of Baron Munchausen. <laughs> Do you know what's happening here? <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know this. He's pulling himself out of the swamp um, and his shorts. <laughs> and his hair. <laughs> so, so bootstrapping basically means that if you are in a kind of situation when no one can help you, then just go ahead and help yourself. <laughs> and this is going to work. And that's exactly what we do when we estimate the standard errors. We bootstrap. Okay, so what is bootstrapping is that um, it's a shame we don't have so much time, but we have our data set. And for, each data, and for our data set, for each instance, we have um, a class label. Okay, we run our cross validation and then we have an estimate, an accuracy of say 30%. Yeah? Then we want to estimate the standard error, meaning that we have to get somehow very, 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 very many other samples and then estimate the accuracy on those. And then the difference will define our standard error. But where to get this many, many data sets? Well, we just sample from our original data set. We just take a subset of the original data set and we estimate the performance on oh, that. The test set? Hmm? Who's driving on the test set and published yeah. on the test set? Yeah. Okay. Make sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So you can do it with uh, putting back or not. We don't do it with putting back. Um, Most of them, I think, it's Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the best about it. It never changes. <laughs> okay. So. Um, Okay, um, so this is the algorithm. 
you start with the set of predictions, you randomly draw a subset of predictions, so you don't even need to run your predictions anymore because your predictions are already there. You just get the, 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 the predictions from your set. Then you estimate, you, you compute an estimate like accuracy and then you repeat it something like 1000 times. Um, based on these values you calculate standard deviation, so this is the, what you get on your full cross-validated set, this is a value that you get on one of the subsets, and this is how standard deviation is calculated, the, just the variance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And then from the standard deviation you estimate the standard error, the variance of your means. Yeah. Clear? Super clear, right? Okay, and this will give us a value something like plus minus 5% or something, then you know that within this be sure I will be performing. Yeah, this will be my performance. All right, so um, as I said, the most difficult part is probably to train the, the method because here we have to define what machine, machine learning method you're going to use, what the parameters are going to be, and how to optimize them. Um, I went for support vector machines because I, so in general, your predictor supposed to be the best machine learning algorithm that is there with the best possible parameter combination. I think this is that the problem is, is that there are like hundreds of different machine learning methods. So which one to go to, 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 to go for and how to test their parameters at the same time. How to do it? Uh, there is no way to do it. It's not possible. There is just not enough computational power. There is just not enough time to, to, to try them on. Uh, so to try them all. And so what you do, you try different, your favorite machine learning algorithms with their basic um, parameters, the one that works best, you go for it. And then you do the whole optimization on this method. This is an approach that is acceptable. However, again, better would be to try all of them with all parameter combinations, but again. So in my case, SVMs, they work best. Are you familiar with SVMs? Everyone? Not so. Okay, so SVM, imagine this coordinate system, and then we have our classes. And SVM basically draws a line that separates the classes, okay? And then the uh, problem is that there can be many different ways of how to separate classes, but there is always just one optimal separation. And the optimal separation is the one with the maximum margin, with the maximum distance to instances of both classes. And this, this whole thing is called hyperplane. In a two-dimensional space, it looks like that, but if you increase the number of dimensions, it will be a three-dimensional hyperplane and so on. So it's, it's a hyperplane, support trick machines that have a hyperplane. All right, uh, kernel trick. Um, this is our data set. We have protein sequences and we have labels. We cannot draw a line in our protein sequences. There is no way to draw a line if you have only protein sequences. What we do, we apply a kernel trick that somehow magically transforms our protein sequences into, into a feature space, high dimensional feature space, where suddenly we can have a hyperplane. This is the kernel trick. Support vector machines, hyperplane kernel tricks. This is the, the, the buzzwords. Okay, um, uh, right, so there are different kernel methods to work with sequences. This can be biological sequences, this can be text sequences, emails, whatever. Um, um, right, and the one that we went for is called prepper kernel. Uh, for our task it worked best. These kernels, they basically uh, w they work with the sequence itself, they go for dimers, trimers, they compare sequences based on this uh, dime trimers and so on. However, profile kernel is more advanced and for our task it worked the best. Okay, so what happens here, imagine we have two protein sequences. Then we have, for one sequence we have a profile, we run Psyblast, <laughs> and then Psyblast gets us a profile that looks like that. We have here all 20 amino acids, and here we have our protein sequence. And the profile tells us how well is this sequence, uh, this amino acid in our sequence is conserved. So how often do we see in the set of homologs, how often do we see an A instead of a C? This is also called conservation matrix. Okay, and then it has two parameters. For an example, there are three and five here. 
Okay, so what happens then is that we said that we are working with, a, with k mirrors of three. This are, these are all, all was going to be three letters uh, mirrors. So all together there are 20 to the power of the third possible k mirrors and this is our feature vector. So the feature vector if, is of the size of 20 to the power of the k mirror size we define. What happens, and in the beginning it's empty, it's zero. Okay, so what happens next is that we take our first k mirror from the sequence and then we look how well is each of those 20 to the third are conserved in our profile. So we compare, the first k mirror is this, right? And then we compare amino acid A is, conver uh, is uh, C is conserved to the A to the value of two, a to the A is conserved to the value of 1, and so on. And then if the sum of this conservation values is lower than a certain threshold, then we increase the value that corresponds in the feature vector that corresponds to this k mirror by the value of 1. Then we move on to the next, um, to the next streamer, and then we do just the same for all possible streamers. And then we basically estimate how well each of the 20 to the, third, to the power of 3 k mirrors are conserved in our profile. So it, 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 it still uses the information from the sequence, but it goes beyond that. It goes into the evolution, it goes into the information of all the homologs of the sequence. Right? And then we do just the same for the second sequence. And then we say that two sequences, they are similar by multiplying their feature vectors and the outcome is a single value. The higher the value, the more similar two protein sequences are. So these values, they can be whatever, not necessarily one, but they can be two and so on, if you would find, if you would have uh, several, what was it, A, T or so, conserved in our streamers. That's how the profile kernel works. It's basically, maybe it looks complicated, but it's basically very, very simple. It looks interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So is, is it clear what is one one standing for a one zero one element of the vector in point one? We have to, to repeat that. Again. So so each of the there's a one here and then the, the the sum of the mm -hmm. values out of this conservation mm -hmm. matrix yeah. profile uh, is lower than the threshold. Yep. So we have two parameters because I define them. Vectors, so to say. Yeah. So what's the length of the vector? How many how many elements does it have? Actually on the slides. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Of course the number of all possible yeah. K pairs. Exactly. So the more this value, the higher is going to be your uh, the larger K will be your future vector. Yeah. Yeah. So that how it. Uh, so basically, it compares the protein sequences by the number of those regions that are conserved, that are, that are shared and conserved between the two sequences. The more such regions, why am I holding this? The more such regions, the the more similar the protein sequences are. Okay. So that was the profile kernel, and in comparison to the other kernels, I saw. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Do you also understand what what goes into the SVM? Um, what goes into the SVM, that's a matrix <laughs> of all proteins in my set on both axes, and then the values of how similar all proteins to all proteins are. That's, that's the input to, to a superjector machine. So, so basically this... Similarity values. So you could look, really, so, so you, you calculate every element of the matrix Mm -hmm. This uh, kernel came from all combinations yeah. of mm -hmm. proteins, and then you put this uh, square matrix mm -hmm. n times m if you have n exactly to a support vector machine. To the support vector. Yeah, and then it defines how so it, it draws a hyperplane, puts a hyperplane uh, based on these numbers, and uh, in order to separate sequences that are more similar, uh, to separate sequences of one class from the other class based on the similarity values. Hmm? Abstract to abstract? 
questions? So if you had, uh, are you going to talk about how, how large your database is? Uh, what database? That you use in order to train this. Uh, no, I already said. Yeah. How? I, I it was on one of the slides. Yeah, there were like 1,600 instances. 16K, so if... if no, 1.6K. With 1,600 buttons? Mm-hmm. I thought the number was higher. Uh, so you have 1,600 projects. How many features do you have for the SVM? One point is After after the kernelization of kernel. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Sorry. All right. So. I saw that this sophisticated profile kernel worked better than other kernel methods, and so I said, fine, I'm not going even to touch the others, I'm going to optimize the parameters on the profile kernel. And again, this was done based on um, standard parameter combination without optimization yet. Okay, the next thing was is that I had a multi-class classification problem, my data set did not consist of proteins of two classes, but it consists of data set, uh, uh, it consists of instances of 18 classes, so it was a multi-class classification problem. There are ready-to-use implementations of how to solve this. One of them is called one, one against all. This is when you develop n classifiers, and then one, each classifier um, basically discriminates between instances of one class and all others. Simple. One versus all. Another one, this is called ensemble of nested dichotomies. It's when you build a tree and you actually build a forest of trees and each tree looks different because each of the trees has a right to exist because there is, uh, this tree would be correct and this tree would be correct for proteins of five classes. So you build um, an ensemble of such trees and then you take uh, the average of estimates of individual tree in order to predict what is what is actually the predicted localization class? Uh, I don't get this. Okay, so you have you have your five classes. For each class, you build a tree. Uh, for no, you have five classes, then you build a tree. So each point of the tree, this is your SVM. So this SVM discriminates between classes one to four and ah. three and five. And this this is randomly chosen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ah, okay. Yeah. So this is say, okay. This is one, two, or four. Yeah. And this is three or five. Yeah. And then you go on this side. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So for example, this tree can predict that that final class will be five. This tree can predict that the final class will be two. And so then you look uh, how many trees predict five. If the mo if most trees predict five, then this will be your final prediction. And, and the leaves are still. The leaves are predicted classes. The leaves are not no SVMs anymore. No, no, these are predicted classes. So this is SVM, it says it's either three or five. Maybe you heard about random forest before. So this is very similar to that. Yeah, I see the analogy, but I don't know this. This is looking cool. It is. And you can seriously go beyond biology for, with this implementations. They are ready available, ready to use implementations. Okay, so this is one. The others, they are class balanced, the economies and data balance. This means that, okay, here we built trees where the number of classes, it always will be the same between the, the, between the levels. And here it will be such that the, the, the number of data points will always be the same um, between the levels. Anyways, there were different uh, implementations. And then we said, well, why to use these random trees if we can actually try and apply the knowledge from biology and develop, define our own tree based on the knowledge that we have. So basically the first discri uh, the, the, the discrimination would be whether it stays in the side as well or not and so on. And so based on what we know from biology, we built our own tree. Same idea, it's just, it's not a collection of trees, it's just like one tree and it resembles one-to-one -one biology. And we saw, I will show you as well, and this is the final implementation, that actually it performed best. So for example, for Archie, it looks like that. First, SVM says, okay, it stays in the side as well or not. If it's predicted, if it goes here, then the next SVM sh says, okay, it is extracellular or stays in the plasma membrane. So. <laughs> Uh, for prokaryotes, it's very similar, uh, cytosol or not, plasma membrane or not, not the localization or not, and so on. And for eukaryote, it looks like that. Um, 
so first definition that we make is whether it's membrane or not membrane. If it's uh, non-membrane, then, then we predict whether it's secreted or not secreted, as shown here. And so on, then whether it goes, if it's secreted, and if it goes to the R. If not, then whether it's secreted or it goes to the Golgi. So it's really biological knowledge impl implemented using the, this, high, uh, this te technology implemented into a machine learning decision, decision tree. And that's like really, really super cool <laughs> about this method. And how big are the data sets, basically? 1,600. The, lower, the lowest SVMs because you split the data every time. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Well, yeah. The data set was not equally distributed. So some classes, some classes there were more data, the others there were less. I mean, the deeper you go in the tree, yeah, the, the, the less, less mm -hmm. the smaller the data set. Mm -hmm. you know, you yeah. So um, I think that the lowest value that I allowed was 20, 20 instances. Mm -hmm. no. Okay, so I saw that in comparison to other ENDs, the difference in the performance was not so big. Um, but if you look at the time, how much it takes, then it was like much faster than the other ENDs. I, would, I could process many more instances than the others. And so that's why it might sense to use this predefined tree than ensembles of trees. So that was... Uh, the whole training, and then you test, and uh, the final performance was 65. We were like, hmm, is this a good number or not? 65 plus minus two. Um, it turned out to be very good <laughs> because for the first decision, membrane and transmembrane, there is a method that is the best in the field that was developed just for the same task. And our method performed just as good as this best method that was performed only for this task. So even though we did not intend to develop to answer this, this question, we were able to answer this question as good as the best method that is there. Okay, then for certain uh, individual classes, for example, for this class, extracellular, I had very many data points, so my accuracy and coverage were very good. But for a chloroplast, for example, I had just a few data points, I think 20, that's it. And then the performance was uh, not so great, but still it was better than random. So if you compare yourself to something like random, and the number of random is much lower than even these numbers are, are already good um, results. So. You can develop the most sophisticated machine learning method, but the, the art then is to correctly interpret the results. Um, yeah, Don't be hyper happy about 100%. Don't be hyper unhappy about 20%. <laughs> it's always the matter of how you look at your data and <laughs> what you're comparing yourself to. OK. Um, so comparison to other methods, there are other implementations. They are also machine learning based. They also use K-mers, uh, but they never use profile kernel. So they, always, they just use uh, K-mers in the sequence. Um, right. So also SVMs, uh, Go annotations, motifs, and SVMs. Um, this method uses K a nearest neighbor approach. And anyways, when we were comparing ourselves to the other methods, then we saw that, yeah, we were much, much better than the others. And that was the um, motivation for publishing the method. And uh, when we looked at sequences with sequence mistakes, so for example, you do a metagenomic analysis and then you define what is a gene, but you make a mistake and a part of a gene is missing and then part of a protein is missing and this happens like all the time. And if you run other prediction methods and if you run our method, then other methods, the, their performance goes super down while the performance of our method still remains. Um, much, much higher. So, so even if there are some kind of mistakes in the protein sequences, one part of the sequence is removed or the other, or some amino acids are missing, this profile kernel, this, 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 this idea behind it is so clever that because it's not, it's not only working with the sequence itself, but it goes into the evolution, into the family of the sequences, and they, they still keep the information. And because of that, the performance is so, so good. So maybe you can use profile kernel also for your other prediction problems later, just as an idea of what crazy things people do. 
Anyways, we went on and published. I was invited suddenly to present at conferences uh, this method because it was really original, really innovative. The performance was amazing. And then Henrik Nielsen, a professor at uh, TUD, he came to me and he said, well, but what will happen if you compare yourself to BLAST? And as a matter of fact, um, I said, well, I did not compare myself to BLAST, which, which was a mistake because you have to compare yourself really to everyone. So I compared only to machine learning methods, but not to simple BLAST, the one that you were talking about. <laughs> um, what happens, uh, um, if you compare yourself to BLAST, is that sometimes BLAST outperforms the most sophisticated machine learning methods. It's not always the case, but sometimes it is. And it was shown on the other methods. So, so everything that was super sophisticated actually performed worse than BLAST. Okay. Um, <laughs> we said, all right, now actually, and this, this, this project was actually a student project. We were based, we were doing in, in the in records class, well, our students were developing that. Okay, so we compared ourselves to BLAST and we saw that, okay, if there are, if there is homology available, then BLAST is really so much better than us. <laughs> But if there is no homology available, then there is not. There are no BLAST predictions. Then, <laughs> then there is just us, right? So how to how to use both? We said, all right. What we are going to do? We are going to use BLAST if it's available. We are just going to copy the predictions, and then if there is no BLAST, then we are going to use log two. <laughs> and this made it to a new method called log three three. <laughs> and <laughs> Simple but effective. <laughs> so this this is the performance. Look, psi blast this log tree as we saw before this, but the combination of both is way higher. <laughs> and same for bacteria. And this is for individual classes. So blast is in the middle of two, but log so, well sometimes it's worse than log two two, but sometimes it's better. But if you combine them them, then the combination is always going to be better. And this was worth it to be published again. That was, as, as, as I said, the students' work. We published in one of the best uh, journals that are there. And all 30 students, <laughs> they were authors of the paper. Um, um, right, this is another benchmarking showing on independent sets. Independent sets came after our database, uh, our method, our log tree was developed. So everything that came to SwissProt after log tree development was said it's going to be independent set. And on that set, again, log tree to outperform other methods. Uh, yeah, and that's the, now it's available. It is actually the most used method over RossLab. We have <coughs> 900 people every month. <laughs> Um, that's how it looks like. Uh, you have three domains, you paste here your protein sequence, and then the output is going to be a localization class with some confidence, and then you can click on your protein ID, and then you would see how the, if it's predicted by lecture two, how the predictions are made. So the first SVM said to 99% it goes this way, and so on, so on, so on. So. And if it's made by BLAST, then it just shows what is the uh, homolog and how good the homology worked. Is it included in predict protein? Yeah. Is predict Absolutely. Protein, is predict protein more popular than that? Uh, yes, but I'm talking about services of Ross Lab. This is. Uh, I thought uh, predict oh. protein was a service of Ross Lab. Uh, it has its own page. It has its own Google Analytics attached. Uh, yeah, they are completely different websites. <laughs> but of course, very important that you get it. It has like thousands of citations already. Well, this has like 150 or so, which is still a huge number. And that's all.